Before we get started, we had some technical issues with the audio this week. Apparently, the game was a vortex on everything. Missed field goals, tie games, and it finished by attacking our audio. Just as we finished recording the show, Adam had a power surge at the hotel he's staying at on the road. And uh, while our normal backup audio is good quality when he's on the road, it is not. So, here is the show with our backup audio. And if you're going to the game this week in New Orleans, ticket prices are under $80 per ticket in some locations of the stadium. So you can visit SeahawkersPodcast.com slash tickets and use one of the services there to find the best prices while helping to support the show. Enjoy the show as we preview the New Orleans Saints game and take a look back on the lowest scoring tie game in NFL history. Go Hawks! Welcome to the Seahawkers Podcast with your host, Adam Emmert. I'd love to draft a tackle and not worry about where I'm going to move him to because he's going to succeed a freaking tackle. And Brandon Schultz. Is Steve Heim the Brian Williams of general managers? I say yes. And for that, do better. Go Hawks! Welcome to the Seahawkers Podcast. I'm Brandon Schultz, and joining me from the road, not in Montana, Montana Seahawker Adam Emery. It's confusing not being at home. It's confusing watching that last game. It's confusing to understand what the hell is going on, Brandon. What the hell is going on? <laughs> well, you know how I like to say winning is better than losing? Yes, I guess I, I, guess I wanted I have, to ask you about this. <laughs> I have to modify it because <laughs> tying is also better than losing. But yet, not better than winning. <laughs> no, it, it, definitely not better than winning. And we're going to get into that. We're we're going to get into this and, and quite a few different things because, Adam, we have to talk about that. This was, despite being a tie and not mm-hmm. kind of liking that feeling that it gives us, this was a historic defensive performance by the Seahawks defense. And uh, also another thing I want to talk about, two very different reactions from the two head coaches after the game. It, it would make you and and listening to these clips, uh, you're going to you're going to wonder if, if well, you're you're going to know both these coaches are not feeling the, the same thing. Uh, right. one, one felt decide, decidedly worse. Exactly. And one more topic, Brandon. The offense had a historic game as well. I think we could talk about that. Yeah, we we could talk about that too. Uh, if if we must talk about the offense, it's probably part of our our duties. We as, are uh, not spinning. We are not spinning this game as a gem. <laughs> that is not happening. If you say one bad thing about the defense, I will drive to Colorado and punch you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't. I can't say too much bad about the defense. That's yeah. for dang sure. But this was an abomination of a football game. And on one side of the football, I agree. And maybe two thirds sides of the football. Look, two thirds. That's that's more than one third. That's an abomination. This was an abomination of a football game. It was beer. It was almost unwatchable. I disagree, but we will we'll get more into that. Also, we have an issue uh, coming out of this game. Speaking of the offense, we have an issue at left tackle. Uh, so we're going to talk about what the Hawks options are there oh, just now. <laughs> <laughs> more of an issue than before. Oh, OK. Oh, good. Oh, I can already tell you're going to be super salty. The show. <laughs> I was super salty when I watched this game. <laughs> I mean, do you want me to desalinate a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe you need to desalinate. <laughs> OK. All right. I can do it. I can do it. But you can you can bring up the saline when it gets to talking about the NFL ratings problem, because I want to get more into that as well. OK. All right. In our lovely commissioner. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about him, too. So, yes, we come away from uh, the game with the Cardinals with a six to six tie after overtime. The all time series with the Cardinals now 17, 17 and one 17 wins, 17 losses, one tie. That is hilarious. That must be why this happened. I mean, there had to be. If there is a God, he would be like, yeah, this needs to be tied up all the way across the board and yeah. include a tie in that. Yeah. yeah. Why not? Yeah. 
Well, Adam, like I said, history was made. It was the the lowest scoring overtime tie in NFL history with 12 points and was tied for the the second lowest scoring Sunday night football game. And and first, you know, before we get into anything else, Adam, as is customary on the show, we have loyal Seahawks fans taking the blame for the non win. And it, it, bless their hearts, man. This is a tough one to take the blame for. I mean, man, that's taking that is literally taking one for the team. One here from Kieran Burns on Facebook took the blame for the non-win. Said, "I take full responsibility for yesterday's game." And Pete Carroll's shocked expression as Stephen Theodore Hauschka missed a twenty-eight yard field goal. I was unable to watch live in the early hours here in the UK. So therefore, wasn't wearing my lucky number four jersey. That was on me. Oh wow! Yeah, no, that was kind of square in the shoulders. I mean, it is. I mean, my dad asked me as we're watching a game. So this house guy, he's like good, right? I'm like, he's house money. He's great. This is gonna be fantastic. So and Kieran, it wasn't. next time, next time you'll know the importance of one. Either staying up late. I, I know it's tough over there in the UK. I think it's a one thirty start time. Or that I can't fault. Or the thing you have to do is go to sleep in your jersey. Yeah. See that now that's the exact right answer. Because look, I can't fault you if you fall asleep. I mean, it's tough. Especially, you know, with the time zone changes and everything, like I'll pass there. But yeah, and there's nothing that says that your house money uh jersey can't be your house money pajamas. <laughs> And speaking of sleeping in proper Seahawks attire, and, and I think this is fitting, Adam, because we have a tie for whose fault it is. Wow. <laughs> this one's from Ann. <laughs> says, fitting. Ann says, it's all my fault. I bought two T-shirts in NFL in the NFL Europe shop sale, a Seahawks training top and a Sherman top. I wore the Sherman top. We lost. I wore the training top for all of our wins. I, I even uh, I've even not been washing it just in case. I went to the Rams game in Twickenham and uh, in my Sherman top and we stayed at the Premier Inn. I forgot to wear my training top to bed as the Hawks game was at 1.30 a.m. and I was too tired to stay up. I woke up this morning and we drew the Cardinals game. It was my fault. I will always wear my training top from now on. I will never wash it and I will never wear my Sherman top on game day again with sincere apologies. Go Hawks from Ann. Go on, Ann. Look, you know, at least Ann answers a very perplexing question to me, how the offense can be one way for the first two games and then a completely different way for the next three games, uh, you know, or for the, for the next couple games, and then be a completely different offense once again this week. It's, uh, it's baffling, man. It's baffling. And I, now I know why. It has to do with Ann's attire. So um, thanks. I needed that. Because I'm baffled. I'm so baffled this week. But I'm the, looking for you to you guys for answers. The good thing, though, here, Adam, that I think we need to remember, we have yet to lose in the wolf gray uniforms. That is the greatest thing ever. And, you know, it took me about, I don't know, it's all 15 minutes after the game to realize that. And then I was like, all right. Yeah, that's true. Still undefeated in the wolf gray. <laughs> that feels pretty good. That feels pretty good. That's a, You know what? That's the best, second best thing about this time. <laughs> It wasn't a loss. Yeah. In well, the Wolf no, Gray. The, you know, the, exactly. And the second best thing is this is worse for the Cardinals. So, or the first best. So th- that's great. All right. Well, before we get to the offense, before we get to the defense, let's start with the missed kick from Mr. Money Hauschka, Adam. And uh, let's let's listen to what Rabel had to say. Here comes Steven Hauschka. Here come the winning three points in a game that the Seahawks couldn't buy a first down for three and a half quarters. Have a chance to win this in overtime. The clock is still ticking down to 20 seconds. Enough time to align right between the hash marks. Play clock down to five. This is going to be a 28-yard field goal to win it. And it's no good. Steven Hauschka misses with seven seconds left. I don't know that I've seen a football game like this ever. A chance to win on both ends of the field. And both kickers come up dry from chip shot range. And with seven seconds left, 
Arizona's going to have one last chance, or this thing ends in a tie. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, all right. All right. You know what? It's not on Ann. It's not on Karen. It's not, it's not on none of them. It's on Rabel. <laughs> I hadn't heard this. Here comes the winning three points. How dare he? How dare he? He played this game. He announces this in, in, in these games. He knows better. He knows better. He did this. Yeah, no, Rabel knows better, and and the announcers, too. They were jinxing the catfish out of Hauschka. They were talking about how bad he had been in the University of Arizona Stadium, how he'd missed more kicks there than any other stadium in the league. Man. But even before then, let's talk a little Hauschka, because uh, one of the field goals before, I mean, he hit it like a wedge, like, and took a divot the size of Manhattan. Yeah. Like, and then on one of the ensuing kickoffs, like, it was like a line drive kickoff. It didn't look like he caught it clean. He looked like he was just off all night. Something about that place, maybe. If that's, if, if. I, I think University of Phoenix Stadium is built on an Indian burial ground, <laughs> and it was some sort of, uh, sacred day to whichever tribe. Maybe it was a Hopi or something like that. It, it, it caused all the kickers to not be able to do anything right. That, that might, because Ken Zero had a bad day himself. That might be the best explanation, the the more most likely explanation that I've heard from anybody. Yeah. And and that's the only kind of analysis that, that you're going to hear here. <laughs> that's, look, I've been racking my brain. Indian <laughs> burial ground. And not only that, this is why the ancestors are so pissed. They roll the remains into the stadium. They play on top of it, and then to grow the grass, they roll the remains right back out the stadium. Mm. They're, they're like they're 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 un, unrested, man. Like they're they're going from place to place because that whole field rolls in and out of the stadium. That's why it's also worse for the Cardinals because they have to play there eight games out of every year. Yeah, and apparently they can't win there anymore because the ancestors are pissed. <laughs> like that's that's it. But special teams, man, let's let's just go over special teams as a whole because it was a struggle for both teams. I mean, let's talk about, uh, obviously, Hauschka misses the field goal, and that's a giant black mark on special teams. But, boy, special teams really showed up in a lot of other ways. In this game. Well, before we move away from Hauschka, I, I wanted to play a, a piece of audio that I thought was really important. And after the game, Adam. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Hauschka was in the locker room and he, he stood up there, answered every question and it wasn't the answers to his questions, but his teammates reactions to his answers that uh, I thought was, was really important to have a listen to. Gut reaction. Is it mechanical? I don't know. Um, You know, it's unfortunate and uh, you know, I feel like I let the team down. Um, you know, I'm I'm not really sure. I just uh, you know, it's unfortunate. I, I feel like I let the team down. I just um, you know, I don't. It, it might be tough for you to hear, but yeah, but listen for after each time he says that I let the team down. You hear in the background somebody saying, "Love you, Housh." Listen, listen again this time. Okay. Gut reaction. Is it mechanical? I don't know. Um, you know, it's unfortunate. And, uh, you know, I feel like I let the team down. Did you see the film yet, but did you confirm it? But what is your gut feeling that went, went wrong? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure. I just, uh, you know, it's unfortunate. I, I feel like I let the team down. I just, um, you know, I don't... Both times, both times after he says that. And then the second time, he, whoever it is, follows up, love you, Housh, with love you, man. Yeah. I just thought that was cool. Well, it is cool because for two weeks in a row now, we've seen an individual for the Seahawks either melt down or struggle, like in an epic way. And the first was Sherman last week, and the team rallies around him and pulls him back because they love him. He's their brother. Hauschka misses a gut-wrenching field goal this week. And, again, the team rallies around him. I mean, that is pretty cool audio. Good on you for catching that. I hadn't caught that. Um, I had just caught Pete Carroll's comments. And I think that also speaks to this. Yeah, and and I want to get to those, too. And you wanted to talk a little special teams. 
Yeah. There were some amazing special teams plays on on part of the Seahawks. Oh man. Camp Chancellor, you remember that movie Freaky Friday? We're like uh or where uh who was it? It was the two actresses, uh Lindsay Lohan and Jamie Lee Curtis like switch bodies, right? Like you know what I think happened this game? Cam Chancellor and Bobby Wagner switched bodies for this game. And like Bobby Wagner got the ability to start jumping over centers in a single bound. A 39 yard field goal attempt from Canton Zero off the left hash mark. Getting right through the middle and blocking it is Bobby Wagner. Bobby Wagner literally fired through. Now there's a flag right behind the defensive line. Let's see what that was all about. He just jumped. He jumped right over. There's no foul for an illegal formation by the defense. First down. First down. Such an amazing athletic play. They timed it up, man. They seem to get one of those every year or every other year where they t- just have a team snap count down when it comes to that field goal kick. And, you know, shame on you, Chris Collinsworth, for not understanding that rule either. No, yeah, because well, now there's a lot of people upset out there uh, because he couldn't get the rule. That's This is why you have officials that you go to in those right. certain situations so you can say, oh, uh, what does the rule book say about that particular play? Was was his toe just minorly grazing the back of the center? Is that an issue? Yeah, Mike Pereira, we come to you for inane crap that we look at on the sideline and that we all can tell and say, well, that's you know inbounds or out of bounds or whatever. And we'll ask your opinion, but when it comes for an actual officiating opinion uh, over something you know important, no, we're going to leave that expertise. Oh, yeah. it's like, it's just such a joke. And look, it took Dean Blandino to come out after the game and say, hey, no, the rule is if you land on the center. Mm-hmm. Or then it's use him foul. for leverage. Right, right. But just grazing him or rubbing up against him is not in any way a foul. It's not. Flag shouldn't be thrown. Bobby was doing legal things. He was doing Superman things. He was saving this game. Like, Bobby Wagner put on his cape this game, man. Like, him and the whole defense. But, man, he wags. He had that swags this game, man. That was impressive. Yeah, you know, it's it's tough to try and pick an MVP in a game where you don't win. But Bobby Wagner, Bobby Wagner was the MVP of this game. And, and so many guys, too, on defense came up big. It's hard to single anybody out, but... I, I think it's, you know, part of our job to try, to try. And Bobby Wagner, if he doesn't block that field goal, he was, if he wasn't the big reason for influencing the miss in overtime, Seahawks lose this game. Yeah. I mean, and if it's not Bobby, though, was the one who was influenced, then it was Richard then, because he was right in there knifing it off of the edge as well, you know? Yeah. So the, the two of them provided pressure, but. We'll get more to the defense in the end, because I, I want to end on a high note when <laughs> okay. it comes to talking about the team. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I, I'd like that. I'd like that. But let's also to give Tacker, Tanner McAvoy some love, man. Yeah, the kid from Wisconsin has a big catch in the game, and then also get the block punt himself. Ryan Quigley is the punter. A bit of a low snap. A flag is down. Ball is blocked! It's rolling around on the 30-yard line. The Seahawks pick it up near side. It's Marsh with the ball. He's run out of bounds. Now let's see what the flag was all about. Holy smokes. Illegal motion. Offense. Yes. He is the point. First down. First down, Seahawks. The deepest penetration of the night. And it's because the Seahawks blocked a punt. Yeah, great play by McAvoy. And, and, and that is what set up the Seahawks three points. Uh, three points, right? And and they hadn't been able to move the ball downfield at all. And oh, sure, they move it. They can move it downfield. <laughs> it was just down the field backwards because <laughs> McAvoy promptly puts it in field goal range, and then they promptly move the catfish back yet again. That was maddening. <laughs> oh my god! I can laugh about it now, but I I still can't. I'm. Oops, it's so it's mo- it's it's not real laughter. It's like that disbelief laughter. Like when right. when somebody tells like a really bad joke that that's so off taste, you can't. Uh, you just kind of have to shake your head and and it's right yeah. because I, because like you're trying to tell them that was bad isn't gonna work. And like it, it, yeah, you just gotta be like okay, 
right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is all. This is my only reaction I have left that Holy I. Holy smokes. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Tanner McAvoy came up big. Let's give John Ryan some credit with a lot of big punts. I yeah. mean, he he had something like uh, a zillion yards of punting, you know, in, in this game. Yeah, that that was was great. I mean, when a guy punts it nine times, nine times, like wow. it, uh, there's a lot of times that can that can go you know the wrong way for you. But well, while we're while we're doling out special teams love, then let's throw it out there to Nico Thorpe, our gunner, for for getting down there early too. Yeah, yeah, good old Nico Thorpe. I knew all about Nico Thorpe up before this game because I'm a fan. Because you know <laughs> you're you're supposed to know these things. Who the hell is Nico Thorpe? He's our gunner, man. Since when? When did this happen? I wasn't aware. <laughs> he showed up in a couple. Jeremy Lane was one of our gunners. Uh, yeah, I think he's one of them. But he showed up a few weeks back in a place. So uh, he's he, you should have maybe noticed him once before. Well, he's he's not one of my 15 Seahawks I should know, apparently. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know Nico Thorpe. But I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative. I'm glad he's here. <laughs> well, he showed up. So well, now that we've now that we've talked special teams, I know you want okay. to wait on defense. Yeah. Let's talk about the the abomination you referred to uh, earlier on. What the catfish? That's what I want to say about this man. Like I, this is the angriest I've been watching a football game in a really long time. Like, like angry throughout the game. Like, I was more angry at the end of Super Bowl 49. Don't get me wrong. But, like, sustained anger through a game. You know, the last time I was this angry? When Clipboard Jesus lost to the Browns 9-6. Like, that, that crap game where we couldn't move the ball at all. Like, the, and the thing was, is it wasn't so much that the Cardinals played such amazing defense. The bigger thing was, is that we shot ourselves in the foot time and freaking again, and then they just throw in a crap officiating call here and there just to piss us off a little bit more. I have never seen so many third and catfish 20s in my entire life. The second That's half it. the second half was full of them. I've never seen that. Never. It, it, it blows my little mind. And then we, our left tackle who can't play goes down. We bring in a dude who's played a total of 15 snaps of football his entire freaking life. Not, 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 not in, call, not in the NFL. Like he played a bunch of college things. No, he played like 20 snaps his entire freaking life. And we put him out there because Tom Cable's got to have his experimental offensive lineman and we can't have a legit catfish backup on the offensive line. And he, he couldn't even touch. He couldn't even touch. Chandler Jones in that game. He couldn't even get his hands on him. What he did, it was just a big handful of jersey. The freaking debacle, man. Russell Wilson nearly got killed. This was, uh, this, I I'm not even mad at Daryl Bevel because this is personnel more than anything. Well, I, I want to get to Daryl Bevel because we did get an email that came in. Before I get to that one, though, I, I got one here from Russ in Denver. It says, hey, guys, yeah. the word that comes to mind from that game last night is just gross. Whether it was Wilson's 6.1 yards per completion, Wilson's one rush for negative one yard, the drive killing holding penalties, Michael's 52 rushing yards, or Hauschka missing the 28 yard field goal that results in a 6 6 tie. I don't know what else works other than catfish. The tackles are yeah. absolutely killing the offense right now, and this has been a recurring theme all season. The edge rushers are consistently pushing Gilliam or Sowell five yards into the backfield at the snap of the ball. They are essentially grabby matadors. The only thing that minimizes the stink of last night's is the defense and Bobby Wagner. That was an epic performance. Go Hawks from Russ in Denver and says, can we revisit the Joe Thomas potential trade? I, I I take back any negative comments about his receding hairline if that helps to get him to Seattle. <laughs> well, apparently Ross Wilwarding, uh, one of the listeners uh, that says near and dear to us, he he he, t- he tweeted out to Joe uh, during the game. Uh, just thinking about you. Yeah. <laughs> just thinking about you, big guy. For no reason, you know. Signed, no reason at all. Signed all Seahawks fans. <laughs> Golly, man. I mean. 
he's right about the tackles. Like, they are really bad. My question is, where is the best in-line blocking wide tight end in college football history that we drafted? Where is he sitting there right off of the left-hand uh, side of either Sal or Fant in that game, helping on every single play? Like, I, I didn't see him. I didn't see him. I, I also didn't see him catching any passes. Well, no, that's because nobody was catching any passes because the Cardinals somehow decided that they were going to quit blowing coverages like they have in every single other game I've watched them in this year and actually stick to their man on every single freaking play. Yeah, uh, and and then when uh, a guy like Curse gets open, he gets an offensive pass interference call thrown on him. Oh, that was such a bad call, and I'll tell you why. The curse push off a little bit, yeah. But the Cardinals receivers were doing that on every freaking play all game long. Yeah. Michael Floyd was a push off machine. Yeah. And never got called. And curse, and, and curse puts his hand on him once. Whoop, there's a flag the second you get something going. And then right after that, then we'll have a hold. And then right after that, you know, I, the whole offense will implode. I'll be third in Tacoma. Like that, that's what happens. And the only reason they didn't lose and only not win is because of the defense. But before we get to defense, let's talk Russell Wilson. Okay. Right. Look, man, that, that was a bad game. And I know it's, it comes out 24, 37, 225 yards. It know, seems that's, okay that's and when you look at the box score, right? It seems, you know, okay. But, it, yeah, it, but the most of that could be piled up in overtime when he finally got it. Right. Got it together. Yeah, he had, what, barely over 100 yards going into overtime, it seemed like. Yeah, yeah. And I think it was like 3 of 14 on his first, you know, 14 passes or something like that. It was something God And one of those passes was to himself. Right. (laughs) I mean, he's just not right. He he really can't move. I feel like he's moving worse now than he was in the Jets. I... But we could... This team could deal with it if they could block for him. Oh, sure. Easily. Any, any, any quarterback that's worth his salt, if you block for him, he's going to tear you up. Like, that's how, that's what good NFL quarterbacks do. And yeah, if you, if you gave him any semblance of time, see, this was the, the thing last year where, you know, he was still having good games when he was getting bum rush. And then they finally blocked for him and suddenly led the league in passer rating. You know, I mean, that's that's the difference. Okay, so if we're going to go here, tell me, would uh, Trevon Boykin, would he have won the game for the Seahawks? No, because he's not a good quarterback yet. He's not a good quarterback yet. He's a one-read rookie that can run around a little bit. So Russell's still the best option. Yeah. Is what I'm getting at. Yeah, you're 100% right. I was just trying to say he's just he's not there yet. Even though he's still the best option, he can't. He, he doesn't have the ability to make up for this dumpster fire of an offensive line. Well, yeah, I think and we can't expect him to. So something's got to change within the offense itself. And last year was the idea of going to the quick passing game. And you saw the Cardinals jump every short short route early in that game. They were all over. They know. They know they could get to the, to Russell Wilson if they if as long as they just covered up those receivers initially. Mm-hmm. Makes it tough. Does make it the bad. good thing, though, the Saints, uh, they do not have the same kind of secondary <laughs> that the Cardinals have. <laughs> uh, no and and so we will question, get to that. Yeah. So my question, Brandon, to you is, um, is this is this offense the one that we saw week one, week two this week, or the ones that we saw are the offense that we saw week three, week four, week six, which was competent? Which offense is it? We don't know yet. I mean, okay. I didn't we're gonna, know it's it's, a, it's going to be a, a week to week situation, I think. Okay. And I think it seven. has to do the the one common thing that you can point to in the first week and the second week and in this game against the Cardinals is that each one of those teams have pass rushers that can that, that are that can overpower the Seahawks offensive line. And the thing about the Jets is I I was surprised that uh, um, they weren't better. But then we saw again just here recently with the Jets, uh, they 
they're just they're not where they were last year. And no, I don't know if that's because of of want to not wanting to give enough effort. Or, yeah, they've given up on that. On and, that. and it seems that way. So yeah. Maybe that's the one thing where you can point to against the Jets team and and say they it, it's just the the opponent didn't play up to their their standard of play. Right. Yeah, that could that could very well be it. Well, now that we've now that we've sufficiently hit bottom in this discussion. <laughs> yeah. Adam, let's talk about this historic defensive effort because almost 100 plays. This defense was on the field for nearly 100 plays. Over five quarters, 15, five 15 minute quarters, they gave up yeah. zero touchdowns and six points. And if the strength and conditioning coach didn't get a game ball after this game, I don't know who should have. I read somewhere that they were on the field longer than any other defense in history. 46 minutes, 21 seconds. That's oh. that's an incredible time to be on the field and and to and, and to dominate. not. And to be dominant and not get frustrated because the offense isn't putting up points. I, like I said, we, we can't say anything bad about the defense. Sure, they gave up two big catches to some tight end we've never heard of. But I, I can take that if it only means six points over 46 minutes, 21 seconds. Yeah, big time. And think about it in these terms. Sure, we gave up two big catches to some random tight end named MoMA, who I've never, again, never heard of. It before in my life and but the thing about that is is that there was no cam chancellor in this game and they were still dominant still dominant and cam chancellor's replacement kelsey mccray deserves a huge mention for for running down jj nelson on what was almost the game yeah. winning touchdown yeah that sequence right like he runs down jj nelson and then what well, how does that go Get J.J. Nelson, then David Johnson nearly gets in the end zone, and Earl Thomas does one of his miraculous, you know, either punch the ball out or knock a guy out, like, on the one centimeter line. Yeah, like that was to, so to close. A that was really and then, close. And then they stuff Johnson the next play. Yeah. I mean, oh, I'm freaking believable, man. Like, that's as championship level of defense as you can get. Yeah, I in a clutch time when you're gassed, right? And, and then that that doesn't even begin to to speak of Cliff Averill, Adam, in this game, the housing oh, commission, man. or or maybe yes. you know if Reggie White was the secretary of defense, is is uh, Cliff Averill now the the secretary of housing and urban development? He, his new Haitian nickname is the housing commissioner. <laughs> that's that's it. Two and a half sacks, six quarterback hits, two batted passes. And led the team with two tackles for a loss. Averill had a huge game. He was a monster out there. And I think that's a lot to do with the idea that they were giving Bennett so much attention. Who played a whale of a game, too, after coming back from getting dinged up the week before. Yeah, a whale of a I game mean, and, and didn't show up in the stat line, really. But it was because no. of, of what Bennett did that allowed Cliff Averill to do what he did. And, and team that up with Frank Clark, who had a sack and a half, a forced fumble, and three quarterback hits. You know, basically what I want to do is just read off the names on the defensive roster and be like, <laughs> that guy was awesome. Like, seriously, like, we could do that for 40 minutes in this game. It's true. Jared Reed had a great game. KJ Wright played great. KJ Wright I played mean, great. Cassius Mars had impactful snaps, man. Like, I just, unbelievable. All Silver Saliga was a, was a brick wall in the running game. Oh, man. And let's talk about the great David Johnson. Let's talk about him for a second. Captain overrated. Sure, he got 113 yards, but on 33 freaking carries, he managed to finally break 100 yards. Good for you. David Johnson didn't even come close to, you know, dominating this game. He didn't have a dominating performance. And any Cardinal fan that tries to sell that on you, tell them to go kick rocks because they're full of crap. Well, he he just pounded the rock, though. I mean, that's that's tough duty against the Seahawks defense. And yeah, right, and he, it, it didn't get anywhere. He was he was effective in the passing game, right? He had eight receptions for for fifty eight yards. He was their second leading receiver in terms of number of receptions. Larry Fitzgerald had nine catches. Great, he caught a bunch of flare passes. I mean, congratulations. 
I, I just, that was such a mediocre performance by a guy. And going back to Bobby Wagner, too, breaking up a pass in the end zone to David Johnson. Exactly. So the, one more thing I wanted to bring up about the defense and the Cardinals offense. I mean, Cardinals fan, you know, you heard of it. Uh, we doubled up the Seahawks on offense. We had like 300 odd some yards offense. We were so great. Oh, congratulations on all your empty freaking yards. You were great between the 20s. Congratulations. You guys are fantastic. <laughs> give me a break. Like, I mean, I, I give a crap about empty yards, man. Yeah, Bobby Wagner nullified all of those empty yards. All of them. The whole defense did, man. Three, three, and one. You know, a lot of people asking, how should I feel about this? If you, if this doesn't make you feel any better, the fact that every team we wanted to lose this weekend lost, and we yes. didn't, and we didn't. The Vikings lost to Philadelphia, at, at, you know, going out there undefeated, yes. and now they got their one loss, uh, and they don't look great. Their offense couldn't put up any points against Philly. Yeah, Falcons lose to the Chargers at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stoked one away, man. Yeah, exactly. The 49ers, you know, in the division, they lost to Tampa. And another team in the division, the Rams, lost to the Giants. And the Vikings got beat by the Eagles. I know. I I feel like I mentioned that one first. Oh, did you? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, like we mentioned with the all of the teams losing, that, that helps mm-hmm. that helps makes you feel a little better. And yes. and we heard from so many players too. It was kind of an empty feeling. After the game, they didn't know how to feel about this. Mm-hmm. And and the coaches, they they didn't necessarily know how to feel about this either. I, I I heard it a lot. And if you invest your time and energy cheering on a team, it, you you expect one of two outcomes, right? You you win mm-hmm. or you lose. And mm-hmm. and each one have a have a very distinct feeling that we're used to. And you want to know you want to know how to feel after a game. And and so I, I bring you these two these two coaches the, for the Seahawks and the Cardinals. Listen, mm-hmm. listen to the two coaches. I, I listened to both their press conferences and the contrast, Adam, between these two is very clear. It's been a long time since I've been in a tie. I don't think I've ever been in a tie before, and, and uh, my brain doesn't know where to go on that. Um, if I have, I don't remember it, and I washed it out. I thought our, our football team... Other than the three plays in the kicking game, was outstanding. Uh, and sometimes, you know, it's going to be where well, the defense is going to have their night and the offense isn't. And, and sometimes it's going to be the other way around. And, and we know that that's going to flop back and forth. And we're not, it has no bearing on the way we look at, at, at things here. We just got to get right and get better and, and, and uh, make sure when we need you, you're there for us. And when we need it, the offense did get down the field. You know, we did have, we, we win a football game. We're going home winners, you know, and, and we just didn't get it done at the end. Battled all night. Um, Put up those kind of numbers, but not the number of points um, because of the kicking game. House made his kicks uh, to, to give us a chance, and uh, unfortunately, didn't make the last one. And uh, he's been making kicks for years around here, and, and, uh, and he's going to hit a lot of winners as we go down the road here. Well, I saw the pylon move. Uh, I'm not sure we. It was, I'm surprised it wasn't reviewed. I think he moved. He ruled that the ball did not cross the line. I never got a clear That's the only thing he could actually put down. When when the pylon gets kicked, it's normally a touchdown. Just identified the heart and the and the connectedness that this team is, stands for and is all about. And we're going to move forward. This this doesn't mean that we're not a good team or anything. It just means this is just what happened tonight. Uh, what it does mean is you know who you got. You got a bunch of guys that will give it up for you forever. And um, it's an amazing group of guys. You know, two field goals, we left three field goals out there. He definitely touched him. You know, I'm sure, you know, I'll talk to the league and we'll get some kind of explanation that that's all catfish like normal. And it starts right up front. All the, they ran a million plays right in a freaking A gap and, and uh, stuff it at you and we just kept slugging it out. Um, it's just an incredible bunch of guys. Make it. There's a professional. This ain't high school, baby. You get paid to make it. Just checked in with him, you know. He'd been making kicks for us for years, and and I love him, and he's our guy. And yeah, I thought he ruled that he didn't touch him. They ruled the flag was that he got up in front of the center within one yard and then jumped. And um, I don't know why I was picked up. 
these guys have played like this for years around here, and it matters to them, and they care so much about it, and they'll lay it out there. That's why they can find a way to play like that and play 90 plays in this game and still finish. And, and when getting off the field, they, they can't even walk. And these guys couldn't walk off the field and, and because they're, they're so drained. And so uh, that's, that's what we've come to understand. We love them for it. Carol's comments, man, give you goosebumps. Oh, man, when he talks about Hauschka, you know, he's my guy. I love him. You know, in comparison to Bruce Arians, you know, this isn't this isn't high school, baby. Right. You know, you got to make a kick. I mean, and then on top of that, being the cry baby catfish Bruce Arians, Bruce Arians is. Oh, I don't know why the flag was picked up. He must have touched him. His foot kicked the pylon. That's usually a touchdown, except for when the ball doesn't go over the goal line. Minor freaking detail, B.A. Like Gosh. I tell my kids, Adam, uh, crying isn't going to get the outcome you want. And and Carol knows yeah. that crushing his kicker after the game isn't going to change the fact Hauschka missed a kick that he should make. You know, the difference is Pete knows his kicker is a grown man who knows mm-hmm. that he screwed up. So right. do, do you kick a grown man while he's down? Much like the Seahawks former coach Jim Mora did when Olinda Mare cost the team a game back in yeah. 2009, right? I forgot about that. Yeah. 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 I think we yeah. can be glad that Jim did it too, because that was the moment that he cost himself a job. So, yes, you know, it's, it just goes to show me that if you're in a situation that you're not familiar, you can treat it like a win or you can treat it like a loss. And, and you heard how each coach chose to treat it. You know, and there's one more thing in that dichotomy that I thought was interesting when you play those back-to-back like that. Bruce Arians said, except for the kicking team, I thought the rest of the team played awesome or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. Heads up, Bruce. Your offense didn't play awesome. They didn't score a touchdown. They stunk. And then you hear Pete Carroll. Defense was awesome. You know, carried us through. The offense didn't have it. Like, Pete Carroll's a realist. He understands what is and isn't working. And Bruce Arians doesn't know his elbow from his butt. Like, he really doesn't. He just doesn't. He's, a, he's a totally delusional, man. He still thinks the Pats look good. But the thing is, too, is that Carroll says he, he's a realist in the fact that he's not heaping blame on one team over another. He's saying nope. that week to week, one team might have, or, you know, one side of the ball might have it, one side of the ball might not. There may come a time where the the Seahawks have a great game on offense and the defense doesn't necessarily show up. I mean, you know, the Atlanta game is a, is a good point to where the defense yeah. missed some plays, but the offense in the end carried the day. So you're not setting it up within your team. Uh, us versus them. Us yeah. versus them. You could see it kind of materialize with Tyron Matthew in the Cardinals because he said it too. He, he made it sound like the defense should have won him the game and it was the the other sides of the ball either not getting in on offense or the kicking game that lost him the game you don't hear that on the seahawks nope because they're a band of brothers man one team one team is crumbling after having one great year and one team started to put together great year after great year after great year and you see the difference it's the internal character it's that grit it's that love for one another peach peak coaches with love man I mean, that's really what it is. And I know that sounds about as hokey and like probably most men who wear hard hats to work just threw up, but it's true. <laughs> it's true. Like, and, and that's why the team stays together. That's why these guys want to stay here. That's why all these superstars don't go to other teams in free agency. It's just, it's, it's bigger than you know. It chemistry is huge. All these teams are talented. All of them. Every NFL team. That's why the Browns would kill the Ohio State Buckeyes. Right. But, like, <laughs> it's about chemistry at the end of the day for the most part, man. That is the, that is the biggest difference in a lot of teams. Well, before we get to the second half of the show, Adam, I, I want to spend a little bit of time on the Saints because we do have a matchup coming up on Sunday. And this this is going to be a – you talk about a test for a defense that just spent 46 minutes on the field. These guys – they better get practices off. They better get because they're going to need the time to and then to not only have to come back home to Seattle, but to go on the road and then face a Saints team in the Superdome where they're known to put up a lot of points, even though they may not do well anywhere else. Drew Brees can pick apart a defense 
and and by the the fact that they just spent so much time on the field, th- I this could be a tough matchup for the Seahawks. Well, yeah, they did spend a lot of time on the field, but you hit the nail on the head. These boys are going to be getting all the time off this week. Yeah. It's going to be a light work week for the defense. You're going to see a lot of the twos running in practice. You're going to hear a lot of reports that this guy sat out, that guy sat out. It's going to be fine. Here's the thing. The number one don't need to get tuned up for Drew Brees. They're hitting on all freaking cylinders. They just need to, they just need to rest up. They'll be fine by the time the New Orleans game rolls around. I'm not worried about the conditioning part of this. Um, I, I'm not even all that worried about Drew Brees and company, for, for that matter. I mean, again, these guys play in the NFC Defense Optional League. I mean, they, they really, I mean, what kind, of, what kind of teams have they faced as far as defense? Their best defense, I believe, they faced this one is the Chiefs, and they just, they just got beat by the Chiefs. Yeah. So I, I, just, I don't know. I don't see the Saints, and I don't think Chiefs' defense is particularly dominant this year. I think they're a slightly above average defense, but they're nowhere near on par with the Seahawks' defense. Not even close. Well, the Saints' defense, while they, they have a few areas of, of where they are in good shape, there are some areas where they are struggling. And, yeah. and, uh, and part of it due to injuries. I mean, they're corners right now. They, they're down to I, second, third string uh, corners. Uh, Brian Dixon, uh, that name doesn't jump out at me. I don't know who that guy is. Ken Crawley, I don't know who that guy is. Those are their, in, when they're in nickel, those are their two outside corners. Yeah, I think your mom got a call this week uh, <laughs> from Sean Payton to see if she can come suit up how her back pedal's looking, you know? Like, yeah, this Saints defense hasn't been good. I mean, They've given up a zillion points this year to every team that they face. I mean, what's their what's their lowest point total that they've given up this year? I, I'm curious. Yeah, so looking at the the New Orleans Saints, the fewest amount of points that they've held a team to was 16 points, and they ended up losing to the Giants. And that was that was going on the road and and in New York. If you just look at what they've done at home in the Superdome. They gave up 35 points to the Raiders. Yep. They gave up 45 points to the Falcons. Yep. And they gave up 38 points to the Panthers. Wow. That is historically terrible. <laughs> so, look, I mean, if this Seahawks offense has an opportunity to get right, I think the Saints defense is absolutely the one that you want to see. And, I, I mean, really, that that to me is such welcome news for this team because I mean the Cardinals came out and played you know they gave us they gave us their best shot because they, they really do I mean rivalry games and all that you know mm-hmm. and I the Saints although we've housed them a couple times in the playoffs and all of that most of those players are largely not there anymore I mean I'm sure Drew Brees has a long memory and all that but man I just I, I, I'm sorry. I can't. I can't get afraid of the Saints somehow. Like it just. Even though this last game was so disconcerting and in in jarring. Well, there's one thing that I've seen by watching the Saints is they are a team that gets out early. We've seen them up twenty-one nothing to an opposing team. But the thing is, the Seahawks. Yeah, they've been known to get off to slow starts. But we've seen Saints teams blow 21 points leads this season. Oh, yeah, big time. I mean, they, they'll, they'll get the points. And look, this is the first time I believe that Jimmy Graham is going to be playing against yeah. the Saints. I mean, that's a big storyline right there. I mean, he it had a really, he was one of the most effective players in overtime when we needed him uh, as the guy that, uh, you know, came up with five catches overall in the game. I mean, he's, he's had big game after big game. Over the last few weeks, I don't see that uh, stopping anytime soon. That's for sure. And here's another thing: you you know the Seahawks can can run a bubble screen, right? The Chiefs <laughs> actually scored a 46 yard touchdown on a bubble screen to a former not, Seahawks running back Spencer Ware, who was lined up on the outside. Do not tell that to Daryl Bevel. Do not <laughs> tell that. To oh, Darryl he knows. He knows Adam. Oh man, we're gonna see him a zillion bubble screen. This is no good. <laughs> Well, and while we're looking at tendencies too, the Saints, uh, so far this season, 
they they do have a lot of success going over the middle. But in this last game against the Chiefs, you, you saw what happens when they go up against a team with an elite safety. You saw a pick six by Eric Berry. Well, by the Chiefs defense, but it was Eric Berry that broke up a pass over the middle and, and tipped it to one of the linebackers that took it to the house. So this is not a team, a defense for the Seahawks that you want to try and go over the middle against. No, not at all. I mean, Area 29 has been shut down in the last couple of weeks. I mean, Earl's been playing out of his behind. I, I don't see that changing anytime soon. And he's had big games against the Saints in the past as well. I just don't see a big shot for the Saints here in this game. I mean, wait, are they are they a team that strikes you as somebody that can really rush run the ball? I mean, nobody's been able to run the ball in this team. Mark Ingram. I mean, not even the great David Johnson. <laughs> Well, I would say that uh, David Johnson is better than than Mark Ingram, but he's you know he's a good he's a good power back. He's okay. He, he's decent. Yeah. 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 I mean, he's nothing to write home about. I mean, when's the last time you sat down yourself and went, "Oh my God, did you see that Mark Ingram run?" I'm just saying that never. My <laughs> my concern would be is is that David Johnson maybe wore him out a little bit and the, and the, and just being out there for that amount of time that maybe Mark Ingram could have a little more success because it's, you know, it's like when you uh, are trying to open a, a pickle <laughs> jar and, and like, uh, you know, you, you, you're really, you know, straining to open that pickle jar for your wife and then you kind of hand it over to her and then she pops it right open. It, it, that's, that's what I worry about. What you should be worried about is the fact that Emily's stronger than you. You didn't <laughs> loosen up anything. <laughs> <laughs> she is flat stronger than you. Well, that's a good time point. To, time, time to hit the curls, man. Yeah, <laughs> I meant I meant my fictional non-stronger wife. Uh, right. <laughs> nah, I. You know what? If you two have to fight tomorrow, even given your military uh, training, my money's on him. <laughs> it is. Well, if you're putting money on people on the defensive line for the Saints, Adam, you got two guys. You got Nick Fairley in the middle. And you got Cameron Jordan on the outside. Those would be the two guys that I would be watching on that Saints defense to see who they're matching up with on the Seahawks offensive line. Yeah, uh, Cameron Jordan is a guy that uh, has had a very productive career and somebody that could very well give our tackles fits because who the heck is going to start a tackle this week? What is what is our plan? Yeah, and it could be a number of different things, right? You could you could see. Uh, <laughs> I I don't even want to say it. You could see George Fant start out there, and uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Please God, no. Or you know, you kind of have to wonder, and and you wonder why we didn't see Jamarcus Webb in this last game because he was active. I went and checked. Jamarcus Webb was active. So which side do you put Webb on? Do you go how he we? He was active. He was active. I must. I thought he must not have been active because they refused to put him in the game. I thought that too, but wow, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, do you go with the lineup that we thought we might see in the preseason and and see Jamarcus Webb line up at the right tackle spot and kick Gilliam over to the left tackle side, or is that's there my vote? That's your, that's your vote. That's my vote. Or, I know this is an American Idol. I know that Tom Cable doesn't care, but that's my vote. Or there's another guy. There's Reese Odiambo, who we haven't seen much of. Right. Okay. I would I would rather see Reese and George Fan. How did George Fan end up in the game? <laughs> How did that happen? I don't know why he, he was active teams. over over everybody else. I have no idea. Oh no! But here's the thing: we got to figure it out because like, or uh, New Orleans is actually about middle of the pack when it comes to run defense and. We faced a few of those defenses now, right? As far as running defenses, still can't run the ball. I don't see that changing. Yeah. So where they are vulnerable is against the pass. They're thirtieth in the league defending the pass. Yeah. We're going to have to be able to throw the football on. No, that's that is going to be to the key to this game, and giving Russell time is going to be key to this game. Now, the other guy we didn't mention was Paul Kruger. Uh, he's you know he's getting a little up there, but he's kind of that other guy on the opposite side of Cameron Jordan. Yeah, a, a guy that's uh, past his prime. I mean, I don't know. Uh, he's got to be situational pass rusher for them at this point. Yeah. I, I don't know that that's somebody that... Um, I just wanted to throw his name out there because going up against okay. either a rookie or <laughs> going against uh, DeMarcus Webb, you might hear his name called. 
So oh, we have to at least God. mention that he's going to be in the game. You, that's, that may be a name you expect to hear. No, oh, man. Well, all I can hope for is that the defense is dominant. I mean, that, that's really it. I'm giving up hope on this offense for a few weeks. I need, I need, I need some proving. I, I, I really do. Well, the last and, time that you gave up on uh, on someone on the Seahawks, they 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 really showed you. So I I like this scenario. When was that? Well, you gave up on zone blocking, and then yeah. they come out and they score a touchdown right away against the the Forty ers Yeah, right? and then what happened? We still can't run the ball. <laughs> They may have won won the battle, lose the war on that one, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I'm just saying maybe they need to be called out again. Maybe you have you maybe you need to call them out before every game. Yeah, yeah. You guys can't run the ball. Can't do it. <laughs> can't hit all that quick passing game stuff anymore. Everybody's onto it. Can't do it. It's gonna be tough to score points against this lofty Saints defense, you know. Can't do it. <laughs> now you're going overboard. Am I? <laughs> I feel I like you so, are. I can't do it. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Man, it's just, you know, at least New Orleans is dead last in the league when it comes to giving the points at 32 and a half a game. That's a lot that of gives points. Me some solace. Yeah. That, that gives me some solace. Yeah. We got to be able to score 23 then, right? Yes. And I would say first to 24 wins, right? Yes. I like it. I like it. You heard it here first. First to 24 wins, it'll be the Seahawks because... They're not giving up more than their season average of 14 points a game, man. Now tied for first again in the league in scoring defense. I could see, I could see a scenario where the Saints go up 17 nothing, and and then they just get shut out from there on out, and the Seahawks come back to win it. I see you shutting your dirty little mouth <laughs> after you say something like that. The Saints get out to early leads and then fold. That's what they do. I, I don't see how that's like a, a shocking prediction. Yeah, so they're NFC Chargers. Is that basically who they are? Right. <laughs> All right, Adam, All right, what do you man. say we come back from the break? Get into some do better, better life. Sounds good, man. And welcome back. Be sure to check out Clinton Bonner's three in three out at seahawkerspodcast.com slash three I three O getting into the second half of the show. We got some new members of the flock celebrating the month of flocktober. Uh, we got some of your emails and of course we got do better and better at life. I love flocktober. I do too. Yeah, that's good for everybody's deal. Flocktober. Man, yeah. people, people started stepping up. It did. Let's uh, let's call out some of those folks that have stepped up. Well, welcome to the flock uh, to Taylor Hazard and David Blevins. Welcome to both of you, both entering our Facebook Ring of Honor page. Let's talk about the Ring of Honor just quickly. So that's uh, how much is it for the to get to the level where you get in with the Ring of Honor? Six bucks a month. That's right. And you know what? This is one of my more favorite things. I, I have a ball doing this because... Everybody that's on the Ring of Honor page is freaking cool, man. They're all good freaking people. And, like, they're in the game. The conversation on the Ring of Honor page is really, really fun. And then it continues throughout the week, too. So, I mean, that's something you guys should seriously consider. If you're if you're really into the Hawks and you really want other great people to chat with, I'm not talking just me and Brandon because we, we interact on there a lot. But that's probably where I do it the most, to be honest. Uh, Brandon's a lot better with all the social media stuff, but... Man, there's so many other really cool folks on the Ring of Honor. You guys have a good time. And I am limiting it to 48 people. So if you yeah. if you want to get in, because we don't want it to get so big that it's that it's not fun Impersonal. anymore. Personal, right? Yeah, and that's what's fun about it. It's very personal. Exactly. So welcome to both of you, and then a welcome to the flock to Martin Monterez. Uh, and Joshua Wilson. Welcome to the flock to both of you. Uh, they're getting in on the bonus shows. And uh, and getting in on the patron league, which we're going to be announcing awesome. winners here shortly. In a sticker, you bet. And then a welcome to the flock to Clint Stevens. Welcome to Mike King. And then a welcome to the flock to John Yamoka. And a welcome to Jace Scott. Jace 
Adam, a man of his word, said he would join after the Atlanta yeah. win, and he followed through. Good, good on you, Jason. Good on all of you, man. I know I made a call that hopefully we could get to 150 subscribers uh, on Patreon by the end of the month. So I think we need about, uh, I think we're getting close, maybe 10 or 12 more. Yeah, yeah. So if you guys can make that happen, that'd be super cool. What a great way to cap off October. And uh, again, this is value for value. If you enjoy this, this is a value for you guys. Um, you know, it'd be great if you'd help us out. Uh, we'd appreciate it. Though. If it's worth one quarter to get a smile every week from me and Adam, that's right. what it works out to. A quarter for yeah. for every show. Yeah, you can't even buy a candy bar for that. No. <laughs> you can't even buy bubble gum for that. And uh, I mentioned Jace, a man of his word, uh, also came in with a, a short email here, said, I enjoyed the heck out of my first game when we played against the Falcons. I followed through with my commitment and became a member of the flock. Tonight, I expect Russell to light it up against the Cardinals. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what your definition of light is. <laughs> right. Uh, hopefully, we continue our streak down there against Arizona. Go Hawks. Well, well, it's almost it's almost continued, but it was uncontinued. We didn't lose. We continued the Wolf Great streak. How about that? Right. And go Hawks. <laughs> and, and thanks, Jace. And then we got a one-time donation from Daniel Weinholz. Our, our oh, what's up, Daniel? Yeah, he chipped in seventeen twenty-eight and says, uh, "I didn't donate seventeen twenty-eight. I donated twelve payments of twelve cents twelve times." <laughs> you know, Daniel's one of the more creative listeners. Yeah, he, he's really he's a cool dude, man. I like it. But yes, get in on the Flocktober promo and go to getintheflock dot com. You only got a week left. Yeah, please do. All right, let's get into Pick'em Winners Seahawkers podcast. Pick'em mm. leader overall, Easley Street with nine hundred and fifty points. M Jelly twenty hanging on there with nine twenty. Bullbuster at 900 points. That's for the KJ Wright autograph football and Easley Street winner this week. 160 points helped launch him into first place. Gary, congrats. That uh, that's a really solid week, man. Two losses. Uh, that, two losses. So the thing about it was, is before uh, coming on here, I, I picked out the, my name. I was I, I was thinking it was going to be Easley Street, but. Um, I didn't realize that he won this week, so he can't win and then win my favorite name of the week. No, because so, he's getting a sticker anyway for winning for the week. Right, exactly. So that can't happen. So we got we got to go with somebody else. Let me let me scroll through here real quick. While you're doing that, I'm gonna I'll mention okay. our patron league winners because those are yes. for the members of the flock. The so if you get in that league, uh, there's weekly prizes for that. And Gary is also a member of the patron league. He can't win both the jersey and the KJ Wright ball. We you know for the patron league we have the the Steve Largent autographed jersey as the final prize. So I'm I'm sorry yeah. to let you know now, Gary. If you do end up the winner at the end of the year, we got to spread around the love. And uh, but I. If someone finishes on the top of both, I, I give that person the choice of what league they want to win. Um, so I'm just throwing that out there right now. And Easley Street, like I said, on top with 950, followed by Rawls Out, Balls Out, and uh, <laughs> tied for third. You have AK-12 Man and Super Tecmo Rawls. Rawls Out, Balls Out wins this week 160 points. And also, like Easley Street, predicted two losses, or not predicted two losses, but took two losses. But Rawls out, balls out. Brandon, he he picks uh, both those games that are decided by a field goal. Wow. Okay. Well, he picked the close ones then. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think uh, I didn't have as, as solid a week as them, but I still had a better week than you and Jared. And for <laughs> that, I, I'm the winner between the three of us, and I'm very excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. Once again. Well, we may not be able to get a pick show in this week, so I just wanted to break, you know. So <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. While you're on travel, you got to make sure you get that in. Yeah, okay. So uh, Maybe I, Jared I and I will do the show and then just leave you out. and uh, that, maybe... That's cool. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. I mean, it, because I don't want you guys uh, drafting off my picks, you know, <laughs> like because I'm clearly better at this than you, both of you. I, I was so tempted after you lost the Thursday night game to just yeah. match up your picks. So I, I would be ensured <laughs> that I would beat you. 
<laughs> That'd have been a good move. That'd have been a good move. I know. I should have done it. Yeah. No, I just make my picks as I see them, and uh, yeah, I just keep winning. So that's that's how I do it. Well, I want to start but, copying Easley Street's picks because uh, that's uh, Gary clearly knows what he's doing. You know, so I, I came up with my name of the week, and, uh, and I'm not copying their picks. I'm not even copying their name. But I'm going to give them credit because I like the trolling name. This is pretty good. The name is Adam Loves Pokemon Go. <laughs> and there's a few of these in here, uh, you know, with references to the Pokemon Go, which I enjoyed. But I like that this trolls me specifically. Well, so Adam you, Loves Pokemon Go. Do you want to know who that is, Adam? Yeah, I do. That's our good friend, Rochelle Matanona. Of course it's Rochelle. <laughs> I didn't even think about it. All right. <laughs> Do I need to pick another one? Rochelle's got stickers and stuff already. <laughs> okay. Oh, this is another one I enjoyed because somebody uh, took a turn of phrase that I use often on on the show and made it their team name. Blind Squirrel. Hmm. Because it's an homage, and I, I appreciate that. Shane Roberts. Congrats. All right. There we go. We knew we'd find somebody <laughs> deserving. Good job, Shane. All right. Let's get into some email, Adam. Uh, okay, good, because this show's getting long. You guys get a big one this week. <laughs> yeah. That's what you get when Adam's on the road. Yeah. He doesn't have anything better one. to do except for sleep. Right. I only have to be in the middle of 4 a.m. tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Fine. Here's one That's from... not true. It's 4.30. Yeah. <laughs> Here's one from John Davidson. Says, hi, fellas. Well, that took some sitting through, but it didn't... <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that took some sitting through, didn't it? But the result keeps them at arm's length. So that's still fine. Hats off to the defense for a, for a heroic effort, but the offense was a mystery, and I still feel confused. We know the O-line is a work in progress, but the game helped me to become a little wiser, I think, because I think we have a decent center and two guards. To me, and I am a long way from this, it is the two tackles that are the problem. Am I pleased then that we have three decent players out of five or disappointed with the two tackles? I, I don't know, and that's the problem. Anyway, on to Sunday and off to Wembley with Barry to see the Redskins. We are also going to meet up with Tunbridge Hawk, Craig, who came to see us last year. He is in our Pick'em's League, too, which uh, is all down to your podcast. I'm fine with this because I am out in front of him and Barry. Okay, you two. <laughs> Wembley, not Cincinnati. Just remember this. Barry is well <laughs> excited, and I'm looking forward to going. And I have promised to root for the Redskins for my friend. 23 teams have now been over, according to Roger Goodell on the TV. That leaves nine to come over. And Hawks are one of the nine. Next year, maybe? Go Hawks from John Davison. Go Hawks, John. Always good to hear from John. I love John. And uh, I hope all you uh, English Seahawkers podcast join, uh, join those guys and uh, for the game there at, uh, where is it again? Wembley? Wembley. Not Cincinnati, no, right? It's, it's not in Cincinnati this week. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate John trying to help us out for the zillionth time because we're beyond. Well, this is the last one, help. so that's good. This is this is the third and final one. This is so. my last. <laughs> this, so this is my last chance to nail it. Right. Okay. <laughs> all right. I'll do my best, John. And if you don't know, if, <laughs> but, if folks don't listen to the all thirty-two picks and IPA show, and, and they should at picks yeah. and, at picks and IPAs dot com, but uh, every single time this season that we've had that we've let off our picks with a game over in England, we we've called it for the home team uh, that's actually in, in the States and, and not uh, recognize the fact that they're playing in England. And uh, yeah, we totally, totally forgot that they're not playing in, you know, the U S right. So, <laughs> it's been a problem. <laughs> and I, I think listeners uh, would feel just fine if the Hawks get, uh, if one of their road games ends up being over there in the UK, I mean, it's, yeah. it is tough for West coasters to get up at six 30 in the morning to watch football. But you know, you guys, you're like, how can we complain when you're staying up till one 30 to watch the game? I, I don't think that, uh, I mean, yeah, hit, hit it a little bit early, get, get out of bed a little bit early. That seems easy. Well, here's the, here's the thing, Brandon, if instead of having to wake up at six 30, we just go to the game in London. <laughs> there you go. I, well, everybody can't do it. I, I mean, some people have to have to stay in everybody Washington and watch. Everybody can and should. <laughs> can you imagine? That'd be awesome. That would be cool. That would be I, well. You know, Paul Allen's got enough money; he could charter uh, <laughs> jets for all the Seahawks fans. Exactly. Yeah, or just a big cruise ship or something. There I we go. <laughs> we can figure this out. Here's one from Garrett, a member of the flock, way up there in northern Ontario. 
You know, I, I'm, oh, what's up? <laughs> I'm tempted to, to call him uh, none of it, Garrett. You know, he's so far up north in Ontario. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we talked about it last week. And he actually references know, it. He, he says, I emailed the show last week just for some clarification. Here in the north, we use that term because the vast majority of the Ontario population lives south of us here in Espanola. Now on to yeah. Sunday night. Because <laughs> that's okay. where Toronto is south. Um, yeah. Let's get one thing straight. Our defense played absolutely lights out. Frank Clark, Cliff Averill, Earl Thomas were monsters out there. Really excited about Thomas and how he's back at his game changing self. Maybe Bam Bam Cam sitting out for a couple weeks allowed Thomas the opportunity to step back into his old shoes. The offense? Disappointing effort from all the guys with the exception of maybe C. Michael. The boys seemed hungover uh, or something worse about the overtime. Why did we not use our timeout instead of rushing the kick? Worried about giving Steven too much time to think about it? Catfish! Our team rallies around each other like no other team in the NFL. The boys would have been able to pump him up, and we wouldn't have had that glaring tie instead of a win. Hmm. I, I, I'm going to disagree with Garrett. I, I didn't feel like the field goal was rushed in any way, shape, or form. And Carroll said that after the game in the press conference that, that he was prepared to call that timeout if if they at all looked rushed. Yeah, if it, it felt out of sequence in any way. Yeah. And it didn't at all. And the other thing is, is like, you don't pump your kicker up before a kick. You let him get in his zone, man. This is like, it's like a golf shot. Like, you, you can't, can't get in dude's face and get him all revved up before the kick. Now, maybe after, sure. But no, yeah, kickers are on their own. Like before their kick, and they want to be on their own. Well, another guy that was uh, significantly upset about this, Matthew, over there in Morgantown, West Virginia, says, I don't even know where to start this week, guys. I'm so tired of an offense with so many weapons and no productivity. The first two weeks of the season, I assumed we were out to our usual slow start. Then weeks three and four came and our offense looked phenomenal. I thought in the Falcons game, our offense was lackluster, but acceptable. But now... What did I just watch? That was absolutely disgusting. I've been a big advocate of going our separate ways with Daryl Bevel, and this game just seals the deal for me. This man's play calling absolutely baffles me. Let, let's just talk about some of the plays Bevel thought would net a positive gain. There was a bubble screen to Kristen Michael where zero blockers were out there with him. I, I don't need to tell you guys how stupid that play call was. There were multiple third and and short 20 plus yard pass attempts. I, I understand you don't want to be predictable, but come on. This is ridiculous. Your offensive tackles are absolute trash. So, you know, Russ has half a second to throw the ball and, and you call this catfish on third and short. I just don't understand. The only time it worked was in overtime when Russ dropped a beautiful ball in on a tight coverage on Jermaine. Russell Wilson has been single-handedly saving this man's job for years now, in my opinion. And now that Russ's running ability has been nerfed, Bevel is being exposed. Y you may think I'm being too hard on Bevel. He he's called fantastic games before, but there are so few and far between. I, I don't want an offense every three weeks. I want it every week. When his base bubble screen chunk play offense doesn't work, he doesn't know how to adjust. Look no further than the Falcons game last week to see a team that can adjust. In the first half, Matt Ryan was pressed and sacked and had no time. What did the Falcons do? They adjusted. After the half, they did quick throws to the to dot up the zones. Then once the pass rush got tired, they started lengthening their plays. That's what we needed in this game. Short, easy completions to build up some confidence. And then maybe we can start doing those chunk plays. A league average OC could have this offense scoring 20 a game. A good OC could have this offense scoring 30 plus a game. Easy. There doesn't seem to be competition for every position. To me, coach, try someone else, Pete. Daryl clearly doesn't know what he's doing. I, I don't want to take up all your sh guys' showtime, so I'll try and wrap this up. Something needs to be done about Bevel. Something needs to be done about our tackles. Our interior line is finally looking okay. Now let's get the rest of it together. Stop committing stupid. After the play penalties, looking at you, Lane, I've never seen a defense more deserving to win a game with an offense more deserving to lose. A tie was the best case scenario for this crapshoot. Great job, defense. Go Hawks from Matt. Yeah, one thing I agree with Matt is with is neither team 
deserve to win this game, so a tie is. <laughs> but you know, he, he he pointed to the fact that he doesn't feel like Bevel can make adjustments, and he made the example of the Falcons, right? Who played one good quarter out of four, correct? Yeah. So you look back at this game, and yeah, the in regulation, the offense was a joke show, but then Daryl Bevel adapted. And he changed some things. He changed some things. And you saw that the Seahawks were able to move the ball up and down the field in overtime. He did make adjustments. He did adapt. And for that, the offense put special team in a position to win the game. So this isn't about Daryl Bevel. As much as... Because he is Seattle's favorite whipping boy, man. <laughs> I mean, that guy... That guy... That guy must... He must look like... It must look like somebody takes a willow switch to his back after every single game. He must have a thousand scars on his back, man. Because everybody loves taking Pebble to tap. But to me, this is all about tap, man. It really is. And the thing is, is it's not the, the other thing it's about is the fact that Russell Wilson can't mask deficiency at tackle right now. Because he can't move. He's not close. As much as we were sold this whole BS about Russell Wilson getting super healthy over the bye week, and it was just going to be a week or two. He's not close at all. And he can't mask the, the tackles. And so this falls on John Schneider. That's who this falls on. Either him or Carol and Cable, too. Those are the guys that you need to look at. It's not Daryl Bell. I wouldn't say Bevel's not completely without blame. I, I think... Uh, involving the run sooner in the game probably would have helped. Uh, looking back at that first half. Sure, because you involve the run earlier in the game and the offensive line can't block for it and you just go right into a, a wall of nothing. The runs I mean, that they had, they had uh, of they had six running plays in the first half. Six of, of the entire first half. Four how of, many total plays did they have? 21. <laughs> Not many. Yeah, so, ne- so nearly a third of the plays. But listen to this. Two thirds of those run plays went for six yards. That's successful on running. Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm saying four out of those six plays went for exactly six yards, like four oh, wow. of them. And, and then one was a, a run for no gain, and I think the and then there was one run for three yards. So I, they, it was fairly effective when they decided to run it. But they were th- they were throwing on on uh, well it was only about half the time that they that they threw on first down so well I, your 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 point is well taken in the aspect that Christian Michael only had sixteen attempts right I mean so there is something to that now the idea that uh, he brought up in the email about throwing it long on third and shorts like that might be something Russell audibles too number one and number two. That's when we get a lot of those big chunk plays when you take chances at that time. Russell's done that his entire career. You know, fourth and, what was it, two or three in the NFC Championship game, and he, and he bombs one to curse in the end zone. Like, he takes risk in those situations. Well, That's and, what he does. And to me, I, I think there was a lot of frustration, and maybe this is what Matt was getting at, was um, on some of those third and longs, you're throwing it short. And, and to me, that's not Bevel. That's a Pete Carroll. That's a Coach Carroll philosophy. Is that you don't you don't throw it into uh, where they're looking uh, for the ball and, and throwing it deep because if it's third and twenty, it's almost you saw him give up when it was when they had the ball and what was it first and thirty for their last possession of of the, the of regulation because <laughs> they had two holding penalties go back and they're yeah. first and thirty and they're like ah screw it we'll just we'll, we'll let the play uh, we'll we'll let it run out and we'll take our chances in overtime that's that's Coach that's Carroll's not, philosophy that's not a philosophy that that's called game situation. That's situational football. Look, Daryl Bevel emptied the third 20 uh, playbook, man. And you only have so many draw plays. Like, that, it really is it. I mean, nobody has plays for third and 20. And you really don't have plays for third and 20 when your freaking tackles are turnstiles, man. And your quarterback doesn't have the wheels to, to get out of it. Like, of course it's a give up there. There's nothing else you can do. You... It's not only that, you didn't just give up on third and 20. You already gave up on first and second down by committing holding penalties. That's when you gave up. That was it. It's not, 
it's not a third down call. You know, and, and going back to the first half, Adam, the the first half, it wasn't that they necessarily played that that terrible. It was that they couldn't convert on third down. At third down conversion in this game as a whole was miserable. They were three of 14. And in that first half, that's what really got them. And, and we talk about staying on schedule, right? And Pete Carroll talks about staying on schedule and being, you know, third and six or shorter on four of their five first half possessions. They were on schedule. And and a big part of it, like going back to the tackles, he Russell, you know, chooses to keep it on that first one. And and he obviously doesn't have that burst of speed, can't get away. These tackled for a loss and they have to punt on the second one. He ends up throwing high to, to uh, Vinette because he was starting to be under pressure uh, on the on the third drive. He had to throw it away because he was under pressure uh, on, on the next one. They had a holding on the offense. And then the pass was incomplete. So they obviously nullified that penalty and they took the incomplete pass. And then on, on the final one, he hits Baldwin on a third and five and it's brought back because of a holding call on Gilliam. And then he ends up throwing it away because of pressure. Every, so many of those was because of the pressure that the tackles were giving up. Yeah. Not only the pressure, but then a penalty. Right. Those holding calls are drop killers, man. Yeah. I mean, there had to have been. Seven drive killers by the offensive one in this game. Yeah. I mean, I'm guessing. I, I didn't have a chance to look it up. That was something I really wanted to. But uh, Well, there were 10 penalties for 90 yards overall. So there were. When you have more penalty yards than rushing yards, you deserve to lose the game. Or not win. Well, I guess that's how it went. <laughs> yeah. Here's another one from, oh, this one. Adam, this one we need to talk about because Tim Connolly, okay. he's got some problems. And, <laughs> okay. and he's, he's got he's got ninety nine problems, and the Hawks are definitely one. Right they now. are definitely one, and uh, yeah. and it's. I'll, I'll read you the email. It says, "Hey guys, okay. I'm in a major dilemma here, and I don't know what to do. I think I'm jinxing the team by watching them this year. I watched the Dolphins game, and they stunk right up until the last five minutes of the game." I watched the Rams game and they stunk again. So I decided to take a few weeks off from watching and what happens? They spank the 49ers and the Jets and go up against and go up big on the Falcons. Of course, as soon as I start following the Falcons game on my phone, after seeing they're up by two scores, they suddenly give up three touchdowns and almost lose the game. It's only after I stopped paying attention to the Falcons game that Earl got the interception and the Seahawks retook the lead tonight. I watched the team put together their worst offensive performance since they lost to the Browns in 2011 and turned the game off midway through overtime after Arizona took a 6-3 to lead. And as soon as I did that, the Hawks suddenly marched down the field and tied the game. <laughs> At this point, I was terrified of turning the game back on because I was convinced that the only reason they tied the game was because I wasn't watching. I even feel like I was responsible for Hauschka shanking the field goal at the end because I was following the field goals game thread so closely. What am I supposed to do? We've had a, we've had talk about lucky hats and lucky jerseys, but what about when it's an actual person that's bringing good or bad luck? Am I supposed to stop watching the team so that everyone else can enjoy them while I sit around and do nothing to do on my Sundays? Or do I keep watching? Even though I know I'm condemning the team and its fans to an endless parade of nine to three, ten to seven, and six to six scores, I don't know if I could subject myself to that, and I certainly don't want to force other fans to watch it. But I also don't want to be left out when they play well on both sides of the ball. I really need some guidance here, and I know you guys will be able to talk through this dilemma on the podcast. Keep up the good work, and whether I keep watching or not. Go Hawks from Tim. Oh, oh, Tim, this this is the most distressing email we've ever gotten to the show, Brandon. And I'm worried about Tim because he's right. This is beyond hats. This is beyond lucky jerseys. This is beyond sitting in the wrong chair while you watch the game or, or anything like that. I don't know about you, Brandon, but I've, I've been in this spot with my fandom where every time I go to try to enjoy my team. 
it seems like the second I do it, they fall apart. And I'm worried for Tim. And But I think as not only podcasters, Brandon, but as sort of a spiritual leader of sorts of the 12s, I think we can help Tim. I, I think we can too. And I think, like you said, it's important to do this because, and, and you can hear it. You can hear the emotion in the email. Tim wants to oh, watch man. this team. And he needs to watch the team. He needs to watch this team. And yeah. I think, I think it comes down to his, his Hakra being out of alignment. Right. It's the spirituality of his fandom, his, his inner Hakra. And for those of you who are familiar with just your regular chakra, there are seven elements to your inner chakra. But when it comes to your inner chakra, there are 12 spiritual elements within you. Now, Tim, what I need you to do right now, wherever you are, is immediately close your eyes, even if you're driving, and start breathing deeply. Bring yourself to a trance-like, trance-like state. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. In. Tim, you, you need to start with feeling your connection to the earth. The, the earth that quakes because of the twelves on game day. Envision an action green orb at the base of your spine and feel the energy at the base of your spine shift. As that flows through you, you can now feel which one of your 12 chakras are out of balance. It is your third chakra, also known as the Russell Wilson chakra. In I can sense this is out of balance because you've lost your positivity of your effect on this team. And we all know that Russell Wilson is the center of positivity and positive thinking. So let's bring your third Hakra back into balance by saying some Russell Wilson. Now breathe in the separation. Breathe out is in the preparation. Breathe in. There is a king. Breathe out. In every crowd. Breathe in. There's no time. Breathe out. To sleep. Does it feel better, Tim? Does it feel more imbalanced? Because I think you're close. But there's one other numbers of your chakra that is out of balance. And that is number one. And as we care for our flock, Brandon, we want to make sure you're a member of the flock, Tim. And to complete the balancing out of your chakra, you need to begin to donate $1 a month to the podcast to bring your chakra full circle. And so we can care for you as a member of the flock. Godspeed, Tim. Godspeed. Man, we almost sound like a uh, one of those commercials on, on late night TV. Oh yeah, that, that's borderline like religious television. Like you know, plant your seed and send in thirty five dollars, <laughs> and uh, God will be good to you. <laughs> I am convinced, though. I, I, this this is going to help Tim and and Tim. You you watch this game. Yes, and you watch every subsequent game. Because even if they struggle, there'll be a point when they start to play well and you will have been watching and you'll break your mindset. Just go for it, man. Embrace it. You just did the chant. Your hawker is cleansed. It is time. All right. It's time now for Do Better. All right, man. Why don't you go first? My Do Better this week, Adam. We've talked about it before. I, I am so tired of hearing about NFL ratings and, and the problems with NFL ratings. Why do we have to hear about this? The the media and the owners are, are the only people that care. If you're watching football, you don't care. If you're not watching football, it doesn't matter to you. 
that would be like if we start losing listeners. And, and uh, I mean, you wouldn't tune in to listen to about how nobody is listening to our show. Mm-hmm. So for one, stop feeding us this garbage about ratings being down. We've said before that I, I don't even think there's really a decline. They just don't know how to count properly with the new technology as part of it. Yet there, there might be some factors of, of not being, you know, having those those prime matchups in prime time that, that could have a little bit to do with it, but not to the extent that they're seeing. So, yes, the, the media and the owners, they're the only people that care. And the reason why the networks want you to care about a decline in ratings is because they care a lot. It hurts their bottom line for those numbers, those those silly little numbers that doesn't matter to anybody. It matters a lot to them. And, and it doesn't even matter if football is still by far the most popular sport to watch. They need to sell ads of guys throwing footballs through a tire swing. If, if fewer people are watching, they can't charge as much for those ads where they have to tell you to seek a doctor if you've been enhanced for more than four hours. <laughs> and that's what it comes down to. So for week after week, having to hear about this and hear about, oh, the ratings are down. Oh, it's it's so terrible because the ratings are down. What is the NFL going to do? Just stop talking about it. Nobody cares. We're football fans. We watch football. We don't want to. We don't care about some arbitrary number do better i agree do better it does feel a little arbitrary but i do think it does reflect a little bit of what's going on in the nfl i was thinking about this this weekend Brandon. And i mean this last sunday night game with the hawks cardinals is a, is a great uh example of this that was awful football that was a that was tough to watch if you're not a fan of one of those two teams you're turning the dial to the oh right. yeah if you're not and a I, fan exactly of one of those two teams yeah and Look, how many times have you turned on a game this year and been like, God, that's terrible football? How many teams do you look at this year? You, back in the last few years, you could point at three to four teams every year and be like, those are damn good teams that really have very few flaws and can win it all. This year, I only see one, and that's the Patriots. Every other team has massive, massive flaws and goes into these giant funks. So I think what they need to do is allow these players to actually freaking practice in the off season. So that the product actually looks good on Sunday, and then the numbers would be up a little bit. Well, I could I could see that that impacting it a little bit, you know, especially with the practice, and um, I, I think there is a little bit of something to that. I I'm not necessarily I don't buy into that being a, a terrible product. There there were two outstanding defensive football teams and defensive performances in that game. That's unwatchable football. For for people who aren't fans of the team, I can because there's no scoring. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and would you have been opposed if that game had turned out Hawks twenty one, Cardinals ten? Would that would you would you have felt would you have felt? Oh man, I didn't get to see that defensive slugfest I was hoping for. Well, no. I would have got it on the Hawks side. Ten points to the Cardinals is a, <laughs> it would have been a heck of an effort by the defense. It's not a slugfest, man. They still only scored six. That was a slugfest. I was on the edge of my sheet, seat for the the last, uh, well, for the entire fourth quarter. I get that. I mean, you and me both. But again, you're only, you know, as far as ratings go, you're only catering to two fan bases. That well, I think that for the most part, you're only really invested in the, the teams that you care about anyway. I, that's not true. I, I watch a lot of games with teams that I don't really give a rip about because I just want to watch football. You're a little bit more of a psycho about watching football, too. Psycho is a strong word. I'd say sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Might do better this week is for none other than the leader of the NFL, Mr. Roger Goodell. And he's caught our ire many different times. But this time, it's because he thinks we're all real stupid and he's real smart. The problem is, this Captain Obvious here can't figure out what's important and what's not important. My example is this Josh Brown thing. Look, Josh Brown comes out and admits to beating his wife. There was a time when his wife called the league office asking why somebody from the NFL was investigating, and she said she didn't want to cooperate with the investigator because she was afraid the NFL would just protect Josh Brown at the end of the day. This was the same league that at the Pro Bowl, Josh Brown was banging on his wife's door in the middle of the night and security had to come and separate them because they were afraid for her safety. And move her to another hotel. And move her to another hotel. And Roger Goodell seems to think that 
that is the, that behavior is equivocable to a bad touchdown uh, celebration or even a good one that somehow degrades the game. And his punishments seem to kind of match up. So the BBC asked him a question at a press conference the other day. Quote, the criticism that comes back to you is that people see punishments for touchdown celebrations, but they're only one game for a domestic violence incident. It must be very difficult to balance those things and explain them. Here's Captain Obvious's response. Goodell. Quote, they are. I understand the public's misunderstanding of those things and how that can be difficult for them to understand how we get to these positions. But those are things that we have to do. I think it's a lot deeper and a lot more complicated than it appears. But it gets a lot of focus. End quote. This isn't complicated. Catfish! One dude beats his wife. Another guy, like, uses a pylon as a golf club to hit the football as a celebration like Ocho Cinco and gets frickin' suspended for more games than a dude that beats the heck out of a female. That is a joke show. There's nothing complicated. I'm not too stupid, and none of the rest of you are, to understand these deep positions. You are in, you're in a deep position, all right? A deep pile of catfish! And you need to dig yourself out. Roger Goodell, you suck at life and do better. Do better indeed. You know, just another case where you find out that you, you never really know the kind of guys that you're cheering for, right? Seahawks fans yep. loved Josh Brown when he was here in Seattle. I remember just yeah. for a kicker to be as beloved as he was when mm-hmm. he was in Seattle. You don't see that very often. And then he showed his true colors when he signed with the Rams. Right, exactly. <laughs> and and now I, I'm sure people don't feel too bad about burning his jersey or, or maybe not burning him, but just I, I remember <laughs> I remember the there first... There was outrage. There was outrage, and I remember the first game that the Rams came back to Seattle and somebody had laid a, a Josh Brown jersey uh, in the middle of the street in Hawk Alley. And <laughs> they were encouraging people to just step all over that jersey on their way to to uh, CenturyLink, yeah. and uh, I admit. Well, they uh, should do that to a Goodell jersey, man. Yeah, because this dude is tone deaf. Well, and just I mean, the the thing that disturbs me is is when you know people like Goodell just think that reporters are are too dumb to understand something. It's not hard to not, understand. Not only the reporters, but the public. Right. Yeah. Like I understand you have a bunch of nuanced rules and all this crap, but you're Goodell. You're the guy. You're basically an emperor of the NFL. You gave yourself that power, that disciplinary power in the last CBA. You can do whatever the hell you want. You suspended some dude four games because balls were two PSI less than they ought to be. But some girl gets a black eye and Josh Brown gets a game. It's a joke show, man. Like this guy, just just use common sense. And he's got none. He's, He's pathetic. I felt like the NFL had learned its lesson and and they increased the suspension to the baseline suspension to six games. And then Josh Brown gets one game. Yeah. And and now we find out about all this stuff that's that's come out since they didn't look into it. No, they didn't even try. Joke. Show. All right. On to better at life. OK. My better at life this week, Brandon, is for a guy we don't talk enough about because his defense is playing awful well. My better at life this week is for none other than defensive coordinator Chris Richard. Yeah. This is a guy that took a defense last week that suffered a mutiny within on the sidelines that I haven't quite seen in a while. Um, and then, but something I don't think was clearly a big deal for the team itself. But, but then took that and all of the controversy surrounding it that the media tried to whip up. And, you know, the divisiveness that, that could cause, the distraction that that could cause, and bring his team out the next week and play, like you said, Brandon, a historically amazing defensive game. That team was on point. They've been on point all season. They're carrying this team. Chris Richard is doing a hell of a job as defensive coordinator. I hope we get him for one more season because I don't know. It's uh, He could easily be another one of those guys who ends up as a head coach uh, as the former defensive coordinator of the Seattle Seahawks. Heck, he could take over in Jacksonville next year. I mean, that could legitimately happen. But Chris Richard is doing a whale of a job, man. He really is. I thought the the way that he rallied the team going through this last week, coming up with an amazing game plan, 
to stop an offense that's supposedly one of the most high flying the game, hold them to six points. It was an amazing job. Uh, Chris Richard, better at life. Yeah, Adam, that NFL, that product on the field was so bad that it produced a historic defensive performance and worthy of uh, Chris Richard getting your better at life nomination. And that, that was a bad performance. That was unwatchable Just football. Because, because one out of the three phases of the game played well doesn't make it a good product. If you turn that game off, you missed a heck of a performance by a defense. Sure, but that ain't going to sell tickets. All right, Adam. Well, my better at life this weekend, and we rail on uh, on media members who who don't quite do their jobs as well as they could. There was an anonymous photographer who actually checked the spelling of our kicker's name. I, I don't even know how it's spelled. <laughs> Steven with a V, Steven with a PH, but apparently oh, the Seahawks... Have- I always thought it was with a V. <laughs> Wikipedia doesn't even have it right anymore. They have it. They have it listed as, as Steve with a PH in one spot and Steve with a V in another spot. So holy smokes, we we, we can't get this right. And and so this anonymous photographer, Adam, is somebody who went to journalism school, mm-hmm. and in classes where you would get hit with a negative twenty five for misspelling a person's name. Not only that, but the, the instructors would tell you. Okay, you do an interview with somebody. His name is Bob. You ask him how to spell his name. <laughs> right. Yeah. Always. Every Always. time. For life. Even yeah. if it seems obvious. Even if like it Steve. seems obvious. Like Steve. Or Steven. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it makes me so happy to, to see that people still, even with dealing with a person who is so well known, that, that mm-hmm. you can look up the spelling of their name online. Like in the Seahawks Media Guide. And and he's still asking how his name is spelled. So and so whether it's it's Stephen with a V or Stephen with a PH, apparently he likes to go by Steve. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, there you go. So if that's what he likes to go by, call him Steve. I, I mean, we like to call him House Money. And, and, you know, he is House Money because, you know, he's going to be better uh, for this game, uh, for this miss. He's going to come back. He's going to be better for it. And uh and I just wanted to give a little bit of love to both uh, anonymous photographer and Steven Hauschka uh, being so mild mannered that uh, he didn't want to let his college know uh, when when that first name misspelling came along. He he was uh, he was just that polite to, to think that it didn't really matter too much. And uh, now it's carried on all the way through many seasons in the NFL. Both you guys better life. Let's get Bayless. All right. So this still hasn't been cleared up. No, they they figured out the actual spelling. It's just which is so it is in fact Stephen with a ph and not with a v. Well, I'm glad they got to the bottom of that. I know Stephen had a lot of other uh, very important questions to answer this week, <laughs> so so I, I can't imagine this is on his priority list. But uh, yeah, kudos to that photographer, man. And leave it to this, Brandon. Leave it to the photojournalist to actually get it right because the print guys. <laughs> can't ever see to good job photographer doing us all all of us with photo j degrees proud what are you doing putting me in the print guy category oh no i'm not putting you there okay. i'm just throwing print dudes <laughs> under the bus fair enough Woo man i hope uh i hope we we got you guys through some things i hope we got tim through some things i hope uh i hope you guys don't mind that i had done a bit of preparation about the saints because i was still processing the cardinals <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah, we made that's it. That's what though. the bonus shows are for. We made, we made it. it. Yeah. And uh, I think it was important to get out so much of of that uh, that Arizona versus Seahawks matchup because it it did feel a little bit weighty. Uh, and I think there were a lot of things to talk about. And not only that, but that will be a game that you will never, ever, ever forget. Never. <laughs> That'll be one. See, like, you know, us as longtime fans, like, people ask us about a game, like, you know, quite some time ago. I'll be like, oh, yeah, I remember that game. And then this happened and that happened. And then this guy scored or whatever. People are like, how do you remember that? Because it was one of those games like this. If you're a fairly new fan, this will be one 15 years from now. You'll be like, oh, you know. The tie. <laughs> back in 16, the tie in, 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 in uh, Arizona. Oh, the kickers. That's we're, crazy. We're both kickers at a chance at a chip shot. Yeah. Couldn't capitalize. <laughs> Yeah, where the Hopi Indians got the revenge for building Phoenix uh, Stadium on their burial ground. Exactly. 
I think with that. There's only one thing left to say. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.